Of course, you will remember that questions may be written out and placed on this desk each evening, and then I will do the best with answering them. <clears throat> In some of our writings, you will find passages referring, well, I might say referring to the subject of prayer, effectiveness of prayer, and so forth. And in particular, there is the passage referring to the Master's statement that if you go to the altar to pray, and there remember that any man has ought against thee, to first get up and make thy peace with thy brother. And in all of these passages, <clears throat> we have been given the fact that this probably means, or at least this is my interpretation of it, that as long as we are holding anything in our consciousness against anyone, as long as we are entertaining malice, envy, jealousy, revenge, hatred, that we are holding a block in our own consciousness, preventing our prayers, our realization, our truth being answered. <clears throat> Lately I have been having deeper unfoldments on that very subject, and uh, one of these came to light Friday night, no, yes, Friday night in Toledo, <clears throat> where I was to have two lectures on Saturday, and on retiring that night, I didn't have a single thought or idea in my head about what was to take place the next day, and of course, I'm quite uh, familiar with that particular experience. It's a usual one with me, but it's never one that I enjoy. I always would like to know what's coming up. Seldom do. But that night I was quite troubled about it, and uh, when I retired, there was still nothing, and I was restless, tossing about. And all of a sudden, the word forgiveness came into my mind. And I started to think about that, and the first thought came to me was, am I sufficient, am I completely purged? Am I entertaining anything in my thought regarding anyone or any group or any nation that would in any way be a bondage? That, uh, I might say, I haven't thoroughly or completely forgiven them. I couldn't find anything. And then my thought turned the other way. Am I really forgiven? Not than any of us that haven't committed offenses, lots of them, and some of a major na nature. We may not have thought of it as a major nature in our human life, but now in our spiritual life, we know that some of the things we used to think of as very minor things really were major. And so I wondered if I have been guilty of offenses, whether I'm myself completely forgiven, purged. Now, there's a secret about forgiveness. There isn't anything or anybody that can forgive us. Therefore, there isn't any possibility of ever being forgiven except under one condition, and that is when there is no possibility of the offense being repeated. In other words, no matter what it is we have ever done, as long as there is the potentiality within us of it being repeated, we are not forgiven. 
think that over a minute because this is very, very deep, but it's very, very true. The idea is this. Just let us supposing, let us suppose for a moment that uh, I am God and uh, that you come to me and uh, you've confessed your fault and you want forgiveness. And I say, what? Forgiveness to do it over again? Oh, no, it'll never happen again. Oh, it couldn't happen again. I've realized the wrongness of it. I've realized the nature of it. It just couldn't happen again. You actually believe it. But don't forget this. I being God, I don't. I see right through to the center of your heart, and I know that the same thing that made you do it once could make you do it again if the same circumstances arose. And so in my omniscience, I say, mm -mm, it's still there. It's still a block within you, and you're still under the penalty of it until you're completely purged of it. And so you go your way, and uh, you ponder it, you meditate, you think. You see it upside down from every angle, and all of a sudden you do catch a clear picture of the not merely the wrongness of it, but the fact that only the state of consciousness that made you do it in the first place could make you do it in the second, and that state of consciousness doesn't exist anymore. That man died daily until it was thoroughly dead, and now you have been reborn of the spirit. And then you come back to God again and say, forgive me. And I say, being God, I don't even know who you are anymore. I don't see anything wrong in you to forgive. Now we have the idea of forgiveness. There really isn't any God to forgive. When the state of consciousness is, uh, has died, that could be guilty of resentment, anger, jealousy, malice, whatever it may have been, there not only is nothing to forgive and nobody to forgive, there isn't even a remembrance or a memory or a sight, not even a smell of smoke. Now, <clears throat> there is then no such thing as one forgiving another or God forgiving us. There is only a dying daily to the state of consciousness that accepted good and evil and acted on it, and when that is thoroughly dead, so that we have come to a place of self-completeness in God, where I know that I and my Father are one. All that the Father hath is mine. I am a child of God. I'm an heir of God, joint heir with Christ in God. Now I can look out on you and on all this world, there isn't a thing you've got that I want. There isn't a sin you could commit that I hold you in uh, condemnation for or criticism for or judgment for, knowing full well the state of consciousness that did it isn't really you. It's an imposed one. And uh, when I am fully and completely aware that I and my Father are one, and I no longer have a desire for person, place, thing, circumstance, or condition. I am reborn of the Spirit, and have carried with me none of the sins, none of the state of, of consciousness that could result in sin, none of the desires that could result in sin, and now I'm purged. It didn't take a God to do it, to forgive me. It took a dying and a rebirthing. And in this new state of consciousness, I need no forgiving because there is no sin. Now, when uh, we come to the state of consciousness that realizes our true identity as children of God, as manifestations of that I which I really am, and uh, we have attained an awareness of our self-completeness in God, so that we truthfully can look out here with not a trace of desire, need, 
with the full and complete realization of fulfillment, whatever it is, whenever it is, God fulfills itself as my individual being, and so never at any moment am I looking other than to the kingdom of God within me. Then you see, then and then only am I purged. Now, when we come to the altar to pray, there is no block between us and the inner source of our being. There is no block of condemnation, of criticism, of judgment. There is no unfulfilled desire. There is no greed, no lust, no anger. There is only the realization that I am at peace with my Father and with all mankind. And so my thought went back inside to that very fact. Have I died to all that is human? Well, I'm not the one to give the answer to that. All I know is that if I have, uh, forgiveness is complete. And if I haven't, that there must be a continuing dying until I have realized my self-completeness in God. But this much I can do. I can't praise myself and declare I am pure, but at least I can turn and with a complete open heart forgive every offense that has ever been aimed at me or mine, personally, family, community, nation, international, and entertain a full and complete sense of forgiveness. And you know, with that realization, I settled down into peace and quiet, and a few months later I had to jump out of bed to make a note, and within the next couple of hours I was out four times making the notes that gave us two lectures, Saturday afternoon and Saturday night. But you see, those lectures came out of a heart and mind at peace. No barrier, no unforgiveness, no sin, no judgment of the fellow man, of the brother. Nothing but a purity of vision. And in that purity of vision there was peace. Since then I've experienced this. That when I sit down to meditate, if I consciously remember that I have naught against any man, that I'm holding nobody in judgment, criticism, condemnation, revenge, that if anyone has sinned against me, I'm not aware that anyone has, but if they have, they're freely forgiven. If they owe me anything, they're freely forgiven. And uh, I turn to the Father within, and please remember, if you've still got anything against me, I'm waiting around for that forgiveness too. And then as I abide in that sense of forgiveness, meditation comes easily. The mind quiets down, thought quiets down, a peace comes. And then meditation comes with it. And uh, so it is that I know now that the subject of forgiveness is an important one in our lives. And I'm commencing to understand. Oh, I'm very quick learning. You see, there's only 28 years for me. <laughs> I'm beginning to understand why the Master said, forgive 70 times 7. Over and over again, forgive, forgive, forgive. Hold no man in judgment, criticism. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. I will take you into paradise with me this night. I can see now that a heart that is entertaining any judgments of uh, our fellow man is a heart not at peace. Any mind entertaining resentments, revenge, hatreds, animality, animosity is not a heart or a soul or a mind at peace. And so there's no use looking for peace of mind or peace of soul or peace of anything else until we have fulfilled that Christly message of uh, forgiving seventy times seven, of forgiving all those who offend us, of uh, forgiving our debts as we would have our debts forgiven. I see so clearly, strangely enough, I saw in 1932 that that was a law when it was applied to money, because I was able to help a man who wanted a debt collected metaphysically, and I was able to tell him, no, we can't do that. But you can forgive the man the debt, and your own debts will be forgiven, and it was so unto him. But only now I'm commencing to perceive 
how it is that we store up within ourselves the barriers that prevent the kingdom of God being established in us by our judgments out here, by the desires that still remain in us out here. And I'm not merely speaking of the sensual desires or what they call moral or immoral desires. I'm not speaking of that at all. A desire, I'm not speaking, yes, that's included, but I mean it's not exclusively what I'm speaking of. I'm speaking of any of the desires that we think of as good, a desire for home, a desire for companionship, a desire for success. All of those things operate in our mind to separate us from the realization that that which I'm seeking I already am. That which I'm seeking I already embody. In other words, God's grace. God's grace isn't something we are going to attain. God's grace isn't something we can earn or deserve. God's grace was planted in us from the beginning since before Abraham was. And it's only waiting to function in us. But it can't function while we are entertaining a sense of separation from our good. So it is that I'm giving you this principle as if it were something new. Well, just because it's new to me. Maybe it hasn't been this new to you. And I'm sure now, looking back into the New Testament, that Jesus knew it so thoroughly that there never is going to be a chance for us to know harmony, to know heaven, until we have been completely forgiven and have completely forgiven and so purged ourselves and come to the altar purified. All right, now let us meditate. Now, during this week, we are going to do some very serious healing work. We're going to do that throughout this class. We're going to do it throughout the next class and the New York class. This infinite way work has spread. And uh, the time has come when people from other metaphysical movements and from the churches, the, pro the Orthodox churches, are reading infinite way literature. And the demand that's coming in from them for healing is something beyond your belief. They read in these books about healing and harmony and health. And then they write in, well, give us a little. Not in those words, but that's what they mean. And uh, it isn't that we can't give it to them. Healing isn't a difficult thing. It's only that there aren't enough to do this work. And uh, if they look to us to see whether we're an example of that healing work, what are we going to say? If we say we are students of the infinite way and we can tell you all about it, but you'll have to write to one of our practitioners if you want a healing. Now, that doesn't add up. Every infinite way student who has been a student for over a year should be doing healing work. And uh, the reason is this. Healing is not difficult. Healing work is not difficult. It really isn't difficult. It is, of course, to those who do not know the modus operandi. It is impossible to those who do not know the principle on which healing is based. But it certainly cannot be difficult for an infinite way student who has the principles shown forth to him in 25 of these books. Now, what is really necessary for healing work beyond the fact, of course, as I said before, of consciousness, not merely knowing the letter, but developing the consciousness? What are the actual principles that we can never afford to forget in a single treatment? Well, now let's get back to it. <clears throat> we could sum up a principle in these words. One power, no power. And let's see what we get. God is the one and only power. God is infinite. 
God is law, therefore God is infinite law. And there is no other law. Is that so? What about a law of disease? Well, take that into your meditation. Is there a law of disease if God is an infinite law? Now remember that God is spirit, therefore God's law must be spiritual, therefore infinite law must be infinite spiritual law. Now is there a law of disease? And the answer has to be no. God is power, God is infinite, therefore God's power is infinite, God's power is good. Is there a power? in sin, disease, lack, limitation, death, weather, climate, infection, contagion. Go back over it again. God is infinite power. Then there is no power in infection and contagion. There is no power in weather or climate. There is no power in sin, disease, lack, limitation, or death. Can there be? God is love. God is infinite. Then love is infinite. Now is there any power in hate, jealousy, animosity? How can there be if God is infinite love? There must be no power then in anything that isn't of the nature of love. God is infinite intelligence, the intelligence that formed and maintains and sustains this universe. Is it true? Look at the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the times and the tides. Not one of them in a second light, so far as human history records, and certainly every day is a living proof that the tide, the tables of tide, and the tables of the activity of the sun, moon, and stars is accurate for a thousand years past and a thousand years to come then it really must be true that God is the infinite intelligence of this universe. Not once has a peach grown on a pear tree. Not once has a watermelon come off of a papaya tree. That means infinite intelligence operating in the form of like begetting like. God must be the infinite intelligence of the universe. Is there then any power in uh, stupidity? Is there any power in insanity? Is there any power in brain? Is there any power in anything other than the infinite intelligence of the universe? No. Why then should we fear a law of disease? Why should we fear a law of weather or climate? Why should we fear the injury of the brain? Why should we fear the movement of the stars? Why should we fear anything in heaven or on earth or in the waters beneath the earth if there is but one power operating then nothing else is power? Now you see <coughs> healing work then doesn't depend on some special powers from on high that certain men and women are given? Not so at all. Healing isn't dependent on how many years you've been a student of truth. Healing is dependent on whether or not you have come to a point of conviction that God is the only law operating in this universe, the only power, the only presence, the only intelligence, the only love. Once you come to that, you can bunch together all of the errors that you know. Sin, disease, death, lack, limitation, infection, contagion, weather, climate, and all the rest of these things and do with them what uh, Paul did. Call them the carnal mind. Or you can call them beliefs. Or you can call them hypnotism or suggestions. Call them anything you like. Call them mortal mind. As long as you lump them all together and say the arm of flesh, not worth fighting, then you begin to heal, and not until then. As long as you are trying to use God or use truth, you're not really a healer, 
And you know what will happen to you like happened to one of our evangelical healers last week. After years and years and years going all over the world doing evangelical healing on the radio, on the television, all over the world, he announced last week that no longer is healing to be his uh, first consideration. He's going out now to save souls for God. Why? Why? I am pretty sure that if he were doing that healing work that he'd love to be doing, that he'd still love to be doing it. Because I haven't known the time in 28 years that I want to go out and save souls for God, except by demonstrating what God's law is and what God's power is, and that it's the only law and the only power. Once you know that, you're saved. Because you haven't got a devil now. You haven't got a Satan to fight anymore. And you haven't got sin to fight. And you haven't got disease to fight. And you haven't even got mortal mind left to fight. Now you've got mortal mind, if you want one, as a term denoting nothingness. Now you've got the carnal mind, if you want one, as the sum total of all error, the arm of flesh, nothing. That is the secret of spiritual healing. It is not a God power over disease. It is not truth over error, or truth over evil, or God over the devil. It is none of those things. It is a conscious realization of God as individual being, the only life, the only law, the only power, and then the ability to look any form of sin, disease in the face and say, neither do I condemn thee. Get out. Neither will I battle thee. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Neither do I fear thee. Why shall I fear what mortal man can do to me? Why shall I fear what mortal things or persons or conditions can do to me if God itself is the only, 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 only law, presence, power, cause, substance, reality. Are we to fight evil forever? What has it gotten our fathers to fight evil? Whether they fought them in the church, whether they fought them in the police department, whether they fought them in politics, what good did it do them? There's more evil on earth today than there's ever been because there's more people to do evil and think evil. Fighting it hasn't overcome it and never will. But we of the metaphysical world have overcome lots and lots and lots of sickness and lots of sin, lots of disease and lots of death. But we haven't done it by going out and fighting the devil. We haven't done it by going out and fighting mortal mind or thinking that we're so pure that God's going to do great things through us. Oh, no, no, no. As far as I'm concerned, God's rain falls on the just and the unjust. As far as I'm concerned, sinners can get healed just as quickly as saints, and a little bit more so because they haven't quite so much self-righteousness. As far as I'm concerned, I'd rather have a good, healthy sinner to heal than a psalm-singing deacon. Because, because the good person thinks they deserve something good. That isn't true. We deserve it, but we don't deserve it more than another. If we happen to be good, it isn't of our doing or our choice. It's only that we're a little more in contact with God and have had a few less temptations than the other fellow. That's all. There but for the grace of God goes I, said a king one time, looking at a sinner and a beggar. And it's true. A lot of this virtue that we have, remember, is due to two things. We've been tempted less than others, or, by the grace of God, we've been a little closer to God than others. And that's all. We haven't a right to take credit for it, or be self-righteous about it, nor believe that because such is the case, that our sinning brothers aren't entitled to all that we are. For the Master's entire teaching was that uh, one uh, black sheep saved is worth more than the 99 who didn't need saving. So it is with us. Let's stop uh, sitting in judgment on this healing business as to who should be healed or when, or as to whether they can only be healed after they're a little more grateful or after they're a little more loving or after they're a little more forgiving. Let's get all that nonsense out of our head. And let's stop all this believing 
that there are mental causes for physical diseases and we can't heal them until we find out what the cause was. Take my word for this. You don't have to know the name of your patient. You don't have to know the name of their disease or what caused it. You don't even have to know if it had a cause. When you know enough to know, you'll know this, that there never was a person on the face of the globe responsible for their own sin or their own disease. And any practice that's based on the belief that any individual's wrong thinking caused it is an erroneous teaching. It just come back out of the dark ages and has been revised. That's all. Don't ever believe it. All of the error that you and I are subject to is a universal belief which we haven't yet learned how to handle. If you catch a cold, it isn't your wrong thinking. It's a universal belief in infection or contagion or drafts or wet feet. If uh, you get tuberculosis, believe me, it isn't any wrong thinking on your part that did it because some mighty fine men and women have had tuberculosis. Lots of them, who, even ministers and priests and rabbis who didn't do any wrong thinking. But they were victims of the universal belief of infection or contagion or climate. It wasn't their fault at all. They talk about cancer being the result of hate and uh, jealousy. In my long practice, I've seen lots of cases of cancer with men and women both who, from all that you could ever know of them, never entertained enough hate or jealousy to bring on a cancer. Oh, they may have had the same resentments that you and I are subject to, but if you and I, with our little hates and our little resentments, are deserving of cancers, boy, oh boy, what a law God must have. Don't you ever believe that for a minute. Cancer is not produced by anything you're thinking or anything you're doing. Cancer is a universal belief. And... Uh, one person becomes a victim of it, and another one becomes a victim of tuberculosis, another one of uh, polio, another one of something else, and not one of them. Talk about uh, mental cause for physical disease. Can you imagine children thinking things or doing things to bring on polio? You can't believe that. Have you ever handled the cases that we've handled of mongoloid babies, babies physically, mentally deformed, and you think that those babies did that bad thinking before they were born? Or do you want to go back to the origin of the Hebrew race and say that the thinking of the parents under the third and fourth generations did it? Why, even the Hebrews knew better than that later. They said, no more let it be heard in Israel that the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on age. Every man lives his own life and is rewarded by his own conduct and pays the punishment of his own conduct. And don't you ever believe when you look at one of these helpless infants that their parents did it, or their grandparents, or their great-grandparents. A universal belief did it, and every one of these has been victims of it. And we have been working very, very hard these last few years on just such cases, just to prove that it was an inheritance that did it, that it wasn't the sins of the fathers that did it, that it was a universal belief just like coals, corpse, alcoholism, tobacco habit, all of these things that we consider of no uh, consequence in and of themselves, but have come to see that they're healed. The thing that started my healing ministry as a success was when I came to the realization that every one of the metaphysical teachings that taught that disease came from an error in an individual's thought was wrong. And I had the revelation that all error is universal belief, the universal mind which we, in one way or another, and I began my practice with never once taking a patient into thought who they were, what they were, what they did, what their sins were, what their parents' sins were, and my practice flourished and became international even before a book was ever written and more so since then. And all based on what? I don't care who you are, what your sins are, or your parents or your grandparents. When you come to me for help, I don't take you into consideration. As a matter of fact, as some of you suspect already, I don't even remember you by name, and I certainly don't remember your uh, claims. When you mention them to me and think I know all about them, 
I don't even know what you're talking about. If I read your letter, it quickly went in the wastebasket. And all my answer was, I'll be with you. you. Don't fear this or that or the other thing. And you've seen the result of the work. Now, all of my work, 28 years, is based on this. There is no mental cause, individual mental cause, for a physical disease. There is no such thing as wrong thinking producing sin, disease, or death. It's a universal mesmerism, a universal belief of a selfhood apart from God, a law apart from God operating. And the minute you handle it from that standpoint, you release your patient. You say to them, neither do I condemn thee. Just don't go and sin anymore unless you bring it back again. Because, forgive me, I'm making noises. How to behave. Don't you see? There's a man across the street and he's robbing a bank. You're going to blame that man that he's got a family to support and he can't get work? His wrong thinking? No, he's ignorant of the fact that he's the son of God, joint heir to all the riches of God, and he thinks he's got to go out and support a family and since he can't get work, that's the only way he can do. That's his fault, I should say. Not, that's religion's fault. It didn't start him out as a baby with the understanding that uh, there's anything you need that you can't get from God. Just turn within and watch the flow from within your own being. And regardless of what the outer need may appear, don't look to man whose breath is in his nostril for it. Turn within yourself. Or if you haven't got the capacity at the moment, go to somebody of spiritual light. Borrow a little of their light until you have enough of your own to work with. But don't go out and borrow it. Don't go out and beg. Don't go out and steal. You're the child of God. The heavenly riches are yours. Turn within, believe this, and be patient until it unfolds. And so it is. I say to you with disease. I don't care what your disease is or mine. You're not responsible for it, neither am I. There is a universal hypnotism operating in this world, and it inflicts itself upon us. Out of the ether come all, uh, come all these suggestions, and uh, we don't know that they're coming. We don't know that at all. It is just like the experiments you've read about of the people who got up in a moving picture theater and went downstairs and bought Coca-Cola and popcorn that they didn't want. Nobody told them to do it. They didn't hear anybody say so. They didn't see anybody advertising. It was just put in the ether and they picked it up. Well, they could just as well have picked up uh, you have a cold. They could just as well have picked up you have cancer. You have fear. And uh, you all know that this is true that you've had lots of days when you've had fear and you didn't know where it came from. But if you'd have gone outside, you'd have probably seen a headline on the street in the newspaper. Or if you'd have turned on your radio, you'd have find that the radio headlines were blaring at you and you don't know why you were fearing. It was just a universal hypnotism. Like being in a theater when a fire takes place. Somebody yells fire, everybody gets panic-stricken. It isn't you. That's that universal thing that runs in the theater from seat to seat and from row to row and all of a sudden you're a victim of it well so it is this world is full of a universal hypnotism sin, disease, death, lack, limitation all of these are included in it none of these are in God's universe none of these are in the kingdom of God none of these are in the consciousness of God and when you have that consciousness which was also in Christ Jesus you won't know fear, sin, disease, death, lack or limitation but you'll know abundance and harmony and peace and joy and resurrection and ascension. So when it comes to healing, first of all, don't look to a God to do the healing for you because you're going to wait forever and get fooled. There isn't any God going to sit around and do any healing for you. Don't ever believe there is. On the other hand, don't be so metaphysical that you're sure the patient brought it on themselves with their wrong thinking. Or maybe Grandma did. <laughs> Don't believe it. Don't believe it. Take every single phase of error that is presented to you and lump it. Lump them all together. 
and call them carnal mind if you want call them mortal mind call them hypnotism but then turn around and say yes but you're the arm of flesh out with you and then if you like go out to a movie or turn on your television for an hour just to prove you're not afraid of the devil <laughs> but don't sit around there watching because that will indicate that you're afraid of if you're orthodox it'll be the devil if you're metaphysical it'll be mortal mind don't do that there is a healing principle now we're not demonstrating it 100 percent that's unfortunate i'm sure we will someday but we really are demonstrating it tremendously the healing principle is this god is one and god is the very eye of my being closer to me than breathing and nearer than hands and feet whither shall i go from that presence if i went to hell that presence would be with me or heaven that presence the place whereon i stand is holy ground if i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i can't get away from i i go right through with me and i that i is god now that I is not a power over sin, disease, or death. That I is power, and there are no other powers. And when you begin to realize that you are dealing with an aggregation of beliefs that have no power whatsoever except in proportion as you entertain them, you are a healer. Then you can sit down and say, Father, forgive me if I believe for a moment that you have ordained disease with power or with law or that you have ordained lack or limitation or that you have ordained death that you ever call anybody home whether they're a newly born infant or 120 years of age you have never yet been responsible for a death nor have you ordained anything to cause a death there is no power in this belief of death there is no power in this belief of disease man adam has invented this picture for himself he built a frankenstein now it's chasing him and yet it's only a mental image the whole of frankenstein the whole of mortal mind the whole of carnal mind is nothing but a mental image and thought and we look at it we created it and now we fear it it's like god the God that most of us worship isn't a God at all. It's a, 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 an image that we built in our own mind. And now we worship it and pray to it and expect it to do something for us. There's no such God. There's only one God. One God, whether it's in the Occident or the Orient. One God, whether it's in the, among the Greeks or the Jews or the bond or the free. There's only one God and I in the midst of me is that God. And it is God in the sense not that it's a power over evil it's a god in the sense that it's infinite omnipresence omnipotence omniscience and there is no other power so bundle up all of these troubles all of these fears all of these dangers atomic bombs fallouts bundle them all up and put them under the head of the arm of flesh human belief a mortal dream mental image and thought there is no power beside the I that I am. And that I that I am is immortal and eternal, and nothing can in any wise enter that defileth or maketh a lie. I and my Father are one. All that the Father hath is mine. All of the intelligence, all the wisdom, all the light, all the spirituality, all the power, all the good, all the grace of God is embodied within me. Now you're going to point to a lot of these names and then say they have power over me heavens no so during these classes we are going to heal heal as we never have before not merely because i am sitting here with this message for you but because you are going to accept this message <coughs> and help me with this healing work let's see that everybody in these rooms feels some measure of healing while this work is going on and it's up to you as well as to me because when i leave this city i don't want to be in the position of these, these evangelical healing healers that even if they do heal once they leave the city somebody gets sick they have to run to a doctor 
What good would it do if I could come to Chicago and heal all of you here? If the minute I leave and you get something wrong, you've got to run out and see a doctor. No, every one of you should be doing the work that I'm doing. Humanly, I'm the same flesh and blood that you are. Spiritually, I'm the same child of God that you are. Not one of us is better than another. Not one of us is worse than another. Each one of us is equal in the sight of God. <coughs> and each one of us can do healing if we can accept a God. A God of omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence. And if we can take every form of error, it isn't any more difficult if it's your child or your grandchild. You're not dealing with people in the healing work. Strangers are no different to you than your flesh and blood. You're dealing with principles. Am I to fear any form of sin, disease, death, lack, or limitation, bombs or whatnots? And the answer is no. How can I fear if there's a God? Fear is atheism. Fear is a conviction that there is no God. Anyone who fears has no God. The minute they have a God, they can't have fear left. And you might as well face it. You might as well face it. You just can't fear if you've got a God. What would you fear? To go through the valley of the shadow of death? Why, aren't we all going to make an exit from this plane of consciousness someday? Haven't we all sent 18, 19, 20-year-old kids out, boys and girls, to get killed at the front? If we weren't afraid to do that to them. Why should we sit around fearing the experience? They've already gone through it, these youngsters. <clears throat> and here we are twice their age and a lot of us sitting around fearing because we're going to go through the experience that we sent them out to go through. Now don't forget this. Passing from this scene is not death. Passing from this scene is only death to the one who fears it. And then they waken up and find out how foolish they were. But death or fe passing from this scene is not death. Passing from this scene is a transitional experience and we all will have to go through it. Jesus Christ went through it. Buddha went through it. Lao Tzu went through it. Shankara went through it. John went through it. Paul went through it. You think we aren't going to go through it? We certainly are. Because it isn't any more a part of God's plan for us to stay on earth forever than it is for us to stay children forever or to stay 30 years of age forever. I suppose if you and I were gods, we'd make it so that everybody would stay 30 to 35. <laughs> and that would be our idea of an ideal world. <clears throat> but if it were, I'm sure God would have arranged it that way. No, our, we live an eternal and an immortal life. Whether we're six years of age, 60 years of age, or 600. We are still living, and, well, and as the body changes from the body of the infant to the body of the child and the body of puberty and the adolescence and the body of uh, the adult, so it passes to the body of what we call middle age, and uh, it should never be the body of old age, it should be the body of real, real maturity. And then should be that transitional experience of uh, walking right out into our next phase of existence where we can continue our work where we left off. Don't fear disease or death. Now, I don't mean by that to sit down and be satisfied with them. I don't mean to hug them to you as if it's something good. The only good thing about it is the opportunity it gives us to prove the nothingness of it. And uh, it really takes quite a bit of sickness before we get to the point of proving sufficiently that it is nothingness to rise above it, to be above it, to live above it. So don't fear disease, don't welcome it, but don't fear it, but accept it as an opportunity to prove that you have a demonstrable principle. And the principle is this, God is the I am. God is your being your mind, your life, your soul, even your body is the temple of the living God and therefore you are immortal and eternal. And everything that appears to you as a picture, as a picture of sin, disease, death, lack and limitation, bundle it all up. Arm of flesh, nothingness. And then be obedient to the rest of it. 
when the Hebrew master said to these people, they do not fear this king and all his followers. They have only the arm of flesh. We have the Lord God Almighty. Remember what came next. And they rested in his word. Now that's what we have to do when we give a treatment. Once we give a treatment which has in it the statement and realization of God as the only life, the only law, the only being, the only cause, the only substance, the only reality, and then we follow it up with that all this that appears to us as negative form is but the arm of flesh or nothingness, then you sit quietly until you feel that inner peace upon you and then rest in that word. Don't go back and mull it over again. Don't go back and give another treatment right away. Don't go back and start wondering if something's going to happen. Don't start looking at the body to see if the fever's down or the pimple's gone. Don't, don't, don't. Go out and take a walk, go horseback riding, go to a movie. I well remember some of the days in Boston when I was filled, filled, loaded with work and uh, I would have treatment after treatment, treatment after treatment, and then I'd lock my door and go across the street to a movie that specialized in Wild West. <laughs> And I was resting in the Word. I was just forgetting the patients and their sins and their diseases and just letting the old bang-bang go up on that screen until it was all out of my system. Then I could walk out and go back to work again. So it is. Please, every one of you can heal. Every single one of you. Just remember that you can only heal, though, spiritually, on a principle, with a principle. You must have a specific principle and you must know it. You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. You must have a principle and that principle must be the allness of God, infinite nature of God, omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience of God. And then you have to go to the other side and pick up all these little threads of wrong thinking, of fear, of uh, sin, of false appetite, all these things, bundle them up all together and say, neither do I condemn thee. I'm a flesh, and I'm going to rest in this word, and you will find that peace descend upon you. And when it does, healings will follow. And I expect that this week you're going to have proof of it, this week you're going to demonstrate it, so that when I go away, there will be enough of you left here to prove to anybody or everybody that comes along that this is a demonstrable principle. Now, I have made the assertion time and time again that if this world knew the healing principle, it would not take many years before there'd be enough healers on earth to really wipe out the errors of the world. But it's like everything else, and our students are just as guilty as the others. They do not, they get emotional about their religion, they get ecstatic about it, they get thrilled about it, but they will not sit down and work with a specific principle until they can commence to feel that inner peace and joy and then rest in the Word, and that's what's got to be done. Now we've had that principle expounded tonight, and we don't have to come back anymore. Just let's... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>